Very excited to be here. I came all the way from Ithaca, New York. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, so I'm not used to this weather. It's definitely a lot nicer than when we have that. Um, but yes, so hi, I'm Caitlin Stanton, and I'm here to talk about my experience as a woman in tech. So before we get started, we're just gonna take a step back and go through a little history of computer science and how diversity has played a role in it. So actually back at the very beginning of the computer science industry, women weren't considered an underrepresented minority. I know that sounds ridiculous, considering that right now, that's a general crisis in the tech industry. Um, but <laughs> at the time, women were seen to be better at details and organization and punctuality, things that happened to be very important when it came to programming. So for example, Ada Lovelace is known as one of the first programmers. Uh, she designed the first computer algorithm, and she even explained how it would be processed, even though Computers did not exist in 1843. Um, Penny Lamar, she was a famous actress, often known as the most beautiful woman in films, and she actually co-created this secret communication system for war that would allow people to switch radio frequencies simultaneously. And even though it wasn't used at the time, it was a little too high as tech for that era, it ended up playing a pivotal role in GPS, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth technology. And then hopefully you guys have heard of Grace Hopper. She coined the term bug. Um, she pulled an actual moth out of her computer. Um, but in addition to that, she also recognized the need for code to not just be binary. Um, before that, machine code was used to write all the programs. So you just wrote a series of ones and zeros, which is very difficult to read. I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, so she recognized the need for code to be written in English, or at least words that humans can understand. And because she thought that that was very important, she ended up writing one of the first compilers in her free time, um, which is really impressive. And so a lot of women ended up making some of the first advancements in technology, which is amazing considering that they didn't have as high technology as we do today. Yes, so I have... Whoop. So those are some statistics on um, women who pursued undergraduate CS degrees. Back in the day, in like the 1960s, gender parity wasn't an issue that people had to worry about. Um, in fact, 50% of all undergraduate CS degrees were earned by women. Um, but after a while, people started to understand that programming was going to be a very lucrative and difficult industry. Um, and so the media tried to portray it as not a field that a woman would want to go into. Video games started to be invented, sort of consumer media kind of pushed women away from these fields. And so you saw the pursuit of technical degrees go down drastically. Within two decades, in the 1980s, um, only 37% of CS degrees were earned by women. And then in 2011, or more recently, only 18% of CS degrees are earned by women. Obviously that number is now going up with like the advent of diversity tech movements, but it was just a very sad exponential decrease in the amount of women who are earning these tech degrees. And so compared to the beginning of my presentation where I was a little bit happier and more women were involved in tech, in tech, these are some statistics from today. So women make up more of the workforce than ever before. Um, we actually influence more of consumer spending than ever before, but we're not as equally represented in just general employee work base and executive positions. Um, also, the social campaign Equal Pay Day, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of it, is basically a way to show how much extra time an average woman, especially women of color and intersectional identities, would have to earn to equal that of a male counterpart in the same position. This year, Equal Pay Day was like two weeks ago, on April 2nd, showing that you have to work four extra months to earn the same paycheck as a man in, your, in that same role, which is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, exactly. I personally don't want to do extra work when I don't have to. So if I don't have to work an extra four months or three, the same amount, that would be fantastic. But currently, that's our situation. So the great thing, though, is that a lot of people are recognizing these statistics. Um, I personally don't want to be in a world where I have to work an extra four months to earn the same amount, or I don't have to claw my way to the top in order to get an executive position. And a lot of people are starting to feel the same way. We start to see a lot of diversity initiatives, like Girls of Code programs. People are putting diversity inclusion officers on their boards. And people are just starting to analyze statistics regarding unconscious biases. And because of this, you can see the diversity in tech and just general diversity movements are increasing in their popularity. 
So now a little more context about me and who I am. So, hello, I'm Caitlin Tampa, uh, just in case you forgot in like the past three minutes. But I'm a 20 year old from New York. Um, I have been coding for the past five years um, and I consider myself a student, engineer, and advocate. And I'll go a little bit more into why I believe that. So student, um, I consider myself very privileged. I am from New York City and I went to high school at Stuyvesant High School. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of it, but basically it has a very strong STEM program. That's where I actually took my first CS class. I took it as part of my sophomore year. It was a required course. I had to take it to graduate, and I absolutely hated it, which is why it's really ironic that I'm here right now talking about women in STEM. Um, and at the same time, I went to Girls Code. Again, did not want to do it. I very much did not like coding. It wasn't something that was approachable for me, but my parents, God bless them. They forced me to apply this program because they thought coding was going to be the next big thing. And they're obviously very right. So as part of the Girls Code program, I was surrounded by 19 other girls in my classroom, and I immediately was hooked on coding. It was ridiculous. After the first week, I was just amazed by the fact that you could write a single line of code and change any part to like a website, game, or app. It was entrancing. And so that's kind of what's led to where I am today. Um, currently, as the introduction said, I am a junior at Cornell University studying electrical and computer engineering with minors in CS and business. And that's just because I was entranced by that first taste of technology and I really wanted to dive deeper into it and pursue it as a field. And that's why I consider myself an engineer. I really love building things. Um, I took a class last semester where we built robots and that was obviously my favorite course, even though I spent like 20 hours in the lab per week. It was ridiculous. But for me, I get joy from creating things, especially things that have a positive impact on the world. Um, and I've had a chance to do this through multiple internships. I've been lucky enough to be interning since I was in high school. I worked at AOL, now called Oath, um, IAC, Qualcomm, and now I'm working at Microsoft. And with each of these internship experiences, I've learned a little bit more about my space in tech. Um, and it's something as simple as learning that I don't want to do website development, but also learning that like, having a diverse team is something that's very useful. And it shows that your products will end up being more approachable to a larger consumer audience. And then lastly, I'm an advocate. So I got my start in coding, mainly through the Girls Who Code and other diversity and tech programs. And because of that, I want to give back to the community as much as possible. Um, back in high school, I noticed that high school students weren't as catered to when it came to hackathons. Um, and so I helped co-found co a hackathon called Death Hacks to help alleviate that. I also noticed that non-traditional tech roles, so like in design, um, were not as well known, especially to females. And so I also co-founded program parties. I was very into hackathons as a high school student. Back at Cornell, one of the first organizations I joined was Women in Computing at Cornell, which is a diversity org that's dedicated to promoting inclusivity in tech by creating a community of women and allies on campus. I also am part of the engineering sorority Alpha Mega Epsilon, which is something that I helped uh, found as part of the fact that I did not see a close-knit engineering community for women, even though there was a co-ed fraternity on campus for engineers. Other, uh, other parts of my advocacy include Built by Girls, which is a mission brand that strives to empower women to follow their career paths no matter what they are, and that includes technology. And then I'm also a part of rewriting the code, which also strives to do the same thing. So as you can see, I'm very involved in diversity in tech, and I try to incorporate that into as many parts of my life as possible. And so it's not easy being a woman in tech. I know I've probably seen like I have it all, considering my like, weird background and how I've been going to an amazing school, have had amazing internships, and have had a great support system along the way. But I can tell you firsthand, it is not easy to get up here on the stage and talk about my experience because I've definitely had highs and lows along the way. There's definitely been times in college where I've pulled all-nighters and I've hated tech and I don't want to go back to my coding class, but something just keeps bringing me back and that's just because I personally love technology and I feel like it's important to have people of different identities present in the field. And so in my five years of being a part of the tech community, I've learned a little bit along the way. Obviously, this advice is more personalized for me. It's not comprehensive at all, and it might not necessarily apply to you, but I consider it a good foundation for how I've started my personal and professional careers. So to start 
focus on inner confidence. Um, so I'm pretty sure a lot of us probably gain our confidence from other people. You like feeling accomplished when someone tells you like, oh, you did a good job on that paper, or like you crushed it at that softball game or something like that. It's great to hear other people congratulate you. You feel great. But the problem is a lot of people take their personal confidence from other people. And that means that at the end of the day, you're not focusing on yourself. So there was a study shown, um, this was actually at Cornell, but it's also um, rampant across other college campuses, where women are more likely to drop out of CS courses no matter their grade. So if you take a core CS course, a woman will be more likely to drop out of the major if she gets an A minus versus a man who gets an E plus in the same course, showing that success isn't just connected to your ability. Instead, it's connected to your confidence in your ability. So this is just showing that at the end of the day, you yourself have to be responsible for your goals and your mistakes and your accomplishments because otherwise no one else is going to advocate for you. The next thing is to embrace failure. Um, so something that I heard back in Girls Who Code was the phrase, I don't know, but I can learn. Um, and this really ties into the fact that like no one is an expert in everything. If you come to a project and you definitely don't know if you can do it, you definitely don't have the skill set for it, you shouldn't just push it away. Because then you're never going to grow in that aspect of your life. You're always going to have that specific weakness and you're never going to be able to tackle that. Instead, it's good to embrace the fact that you don't know everything and to let people know and grow from them. You can adapt. I've done that a lot. I've had tons of projects where I've said, I don't know this, but I would love to learn it. I'm very eager to try it out. I'm very eager to see if this is something I want to do. And so by having this mentality, you, you incorporate some sort of positive thinking towards failure. And it's not easy. It's not easy making mistakes. I can tell you from firsthand experience, I hate failure, but it helps you grow as a person. And so it's important to try to have that positive mindset whenever you're tackling a project. Next thing that kind of ties into it is seek mentorship. So again, you're not going to be an expert in absolutely everything. If you were, wow, incredible. But there's definitely going to be things that you don't know. And so it's important to learn from the people around you. So something that I try to do at every internship is interact with other teams. So I, for example, am going to be on an electrical engineering team at Microsoft. I want to get mentorship from other electrical engineers, of course. But I'm also probably going to reach out to product managers and software engineers and designers, just to kind of get a different aspect of the company and learn more about their role and how they interpret the technology within Microsoft. Because otherwise, I'm not gonna learn anything new. I'm just gonna be stuck in this electrical engineering world and nothing is gonna be moving forward for me. And so it's important to find mentors like that in your life. They don't necessarily have to be Microsoft engineers. They can be your professor, they can be your parent, they can be an upperclassman student, they can even be your friend. The most important thing, though, is not who they are, it's more about how they align with you and your goals, and if you can benefit them from being in your network. And then that kind of ties into finding your support system. Um, I've noticed, especially in college, people are very quick to help other people out. I have this little group of ECEs that I work together with, and we're always relying on each other for problem sets, group assignments, everything like that. We take all the same classes together, and it's because we enjoy working with each other, and we know that if someone's struggling, another person will come in and swoop in and try to help. And so it's important to try to find that support system, whether it's for academics or it's for personal use or something like that. And so it's important to have some sort of network of family, friends, and other people behind you to kind of cheer you on, to give you advice, to be a person to listen to your rants or anything like that. Because otherwise, you're just going to be going through life alone, and that's not fun at all. And so by having that kind of support system of people behind you, you definitely can move forward in whatever your goals are, whether they're academic, professional, or personal. And then last, but certainly not least, is taking care of yourself. Um, I think the other speakers were saying this, self-care is something that Gen Z especially is very aware of. Um, I can speak from personal experience. College has been a rough time. So sophomore year, I used to go to bed at like 3 a.m. and wake up at 7.30. Do not do that. It's terrible. My brain stopped working after like a couple of weeks of that. And I remember just sitting in office hours, listening to my TA helping me with this project, and I literally did not understand a word of what she was saying. I was like, I know you're speaking English, but I, my brain just cannot understand anything. And it's just because I was so sleep deprived that I just wasn't effective anymore. And I took a step back and looked at myself, and I was like, look, if you want to be effective as an engineer, if you want to finish your problem sets, if you want to be a functioning human being, you're going to have to make sure that you're healthy. And that's physical, emotional, mental health. And you have to have, make sure that there's a balance in all of them. 
And so, yes, it does take time to go on a walk or take a nap or hang out with your friends, but I like to think it of it less as taking time away from your obligations, but more of taking time and adding it into having a positive mindset and staying healthy. Because at the end of the day, like you are going to have to be comfortable with your body, comfortable with your mind, in order to be the most effective person possible. And so I've been speaking about this from the perspective of a woman in STEM towards other minorities, but I definitely don't want to leave out the allies in the audience, the men in the audience, because allyship is incredibly important. Um, the diversity and tech movement will not get anywhere without people who are allies who have used their privilege and platform to move the, the, this movement forward. This can be anything from speaking on a stage, which if you're not comfortable, don't do that. But it could also be something as small as recognizing different inequities around you. Maybe there's unconscious bias. Maybe someone says something that rubs someone a little bit the wrong way. Just calling that out is just a small moving forward in diversity in STEM and diversity in general and making sure that everybody feels included and properly cared for. And so there's this misconception that the diversity in tech movement is meant to take away positions for people who aren't minorities. That's definitely not true. If anything, we're just trying to make sure that there's more room for us at the table. There's more seats at this table for us to provide our input, provide our identities, provide our backgrounds and experiences to help make the world and the products that we make and everything like that a better place. And so with that, Thank you so much for listening to me and hopefully we can make